will open to Judges chapter 7 and verse 9. And it happened on the same night that the Lord said to him, him being Gideon, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have delivered it into your hand. Somebody say Amen. amen. The story of Gideon is a very famous story in the Bible where a, a man who went against an army of 300 with 300 men and achieved a great, very great victory. This story starts with the fact that Israel, the people who Gideon belong, belonged to, that they didn't serve God, they disobeyed God and as a result of that they found themselves in bondage and they found themselves in some really shady waters. They found themselves in some big problems. And God sent them a prophet to warn them that what they were doing is not good but they still didn't obey God and so next thing that God does, God doesn't plan how to wipe them out or destroy them. God is looking for a man with whom he can share his plan and his desire to save the country and he finds this man who is least likely hero Gideon and begins to tell him that he wants to use him to set his country free. And of course Gideon says no way that's not me I am I am not the kind of guy I don't want to be a hero I don't want to help nobody I'm just trying to here survive. Let me just kind of pause for a moment and tell you something about our God. Different people have different obsessions. Some people are obsessed with shoes, some with purses, others with cars. Some people are obsessed with houses, some with clothes. Some people are obsessed with Instagram, some with Snapchat, and others with Twitter. God also has an obsession. God's obsession is also God's weakness. God's obsession is people. He's always been obsessed with people. When he made the sun, the stars and the moon and everything, he sat on his throne, opened his mouth and everything was made. When it comes to making you and me, God got down from his throne, rolled up his leaves, sleeves and the Bible says with his hands, he made us with his hands. Angels were on the side and they took notice. He has a special interest in the human species. And when we disobeyed God, they thought God will do what he did to Satan. When Satan disobeyed God, he simply said that that's it, it's over. I'm preparing a lake of fire and that's where you will go. Except when people disobeyed God, God started to move things so that these people don't go to hell. And angels took on the side and they noticed he's obsessed with people. When they make mistakes, he moves heaven and earth. He lets Jesus go on the cross and die for them because somehow these people are important to him. And when Jesus died on the cross for us, for people, and he went to heaven, God sends the Holy Spirit so that the rest of the people will find God. God uses his army instead of protecting heaven, he dispatches his army to protect people. God's obsession always has been people. God didn't care about gold, God didn't care about diamonds, and God didn't care about silver. God always cared about people. God didn't care about planets or even universes. That wasn't his main obsession. What's on his mind always was, always is and always will be a human people. You and I are his obsession. God narrows his whole attention and his whole care to one thing and one thing alone and that is humans. He doesn't necessarily like specific people. He likes all kinds of people. People who are good and people who are bad. People who are smart and people who are not so smart. People who do good things in life and people who don't measure up in life. People who are white or black, tall or short, young or old. God's obsession is people and Satan knows that. Satan knows the way you get back at God, you don't create an army and go against God. That's completely pointless, you'll never stand the chance. But if you mess with people, it's his weakness. It hurts God when people hurt. To that degree that at one time God said that people matter to me so much that anytime you touch my people, he said, you touch an apple of my eye. I don't know if ever an accident, you scratched an apple of your eye or something, some little thing got underneath and how sensitive it has become to you when your eye was touched inappropriately. I want to let you know today, every single human being that walks on the streets of our city, is as tender and as important to God as your eyes. 
God's obsession is people. God loves people. God loves sick people and God loves healthy people. God loves people who believe in Him and those who turn their back and even don't want to acknowledge His existence. God loves people who worship Him and God also grieves and hurts and loves people who want to have nothing to do with Him. God loves people. That's why He started the church for people. That's why God wants to give miracles for people. Not to elevate the man. That's why God wants to, us to have home groups for people. That's why we invite people, not so that we can just grow an organization or a social club can become big, but because God's heart from the beginning and it is now His attention and His obsession has always been people. And when you get close to God, you find out that to be true. Because God loves people and there's so many of them on earth. There are seven billion something people on earth. Every single one of them is as important to God as you are. Every one of them is as important to God as you are. God doesn't have a luxury of choosing percentage of people that he loves and the other percentage who cares what happened to him. God doesn't have a luxury of saying this is my people and these people well they're heathens, well they're Muslims, well they're Hindus, well they're, well, they're Buddhists, well they're atheists, well they're pagans, well they're Satanists. God doesn't have a luxury of seeing the world through those eyes. The way that God sees the world is that every single person who bleeds bread, who bleeds red and who has nostrils and who has breath in their nostrils, God looks at them and his heart beats for them. As a mother's child, as mother's heart beats for his child. You know the brother that I presented today with the dreadlocks is actually my brother. But many years ago he wasn't serving Jesus. I am the oldest of five. I have two brothers and two sisters. And when my brother wasn't serving the Lord and um, the enemy took hold of his soul and he was doing a lot of other things that were not healthy. He was making poor decisions and these poor decisions will hurt my mom and my dad. Sometimes it will hurt them so much that when I would walk into the house of my parents and my brother wouldn't be there, my parents would be depressed. And sometimes it got in, literally, you, you, it became kind of depressing to walk into their house where I would avoid going to their house because I knew it's the same story. My brother's not doing well and my parents are not doing good either. And sometimes I would, in my mind, I wouldn't say it to my parents, but I would think in my mind. I'm like, parents, you have four siblings who are doing good and one not so good. Why don't we disown him? Why don't we focus on the four that are doing good and forget about one who's not doing good? I'm like and I was always upset in my heart I'm like how can mom lose a perspective not see four one is a handsome youth pastor you know then they have two sisters who are doing really good I have a brother and all of them are serving God and here is one person who is not doing well why don't you just get happy about four and not really don't lose perspective when you have one not serving God but see when you're a mom and you're a dad you don't have a luxury of seeing like that only I can see like that but if you're a mom and dad you, if one person is not doing good nobody's doing good that's why the Bible says that Jesus will leave 99 and go look for the one because if one is missing 99 is missing in God's eyes God's obsession is people I want us to catch it tonight. This is not about bribing people to church. This is not about just growing and making this big auditorium. There is awesome places in Tri Cities where auditoriums are filled. But this is about to communicate that there is a God who created people and people sinned against Him and He loves them still and willing to do anything it takes so they are with Him. And they will never be happy until they're with Him. Because He created us, it's as though on purpose that we cannot function without Him. A fish cannot function without water, your body cannot function without air and your soul cannot function without God. Without God no matter how much alcohol, no matter how much money, no matter how much things you throw into your soul, it's this bottomless pit never, no amount is ever enough until a drop of God's love comes in and something begins to bubble inside. Something begins to kick in inside. God loves people and because God loves people God has a very big vision. 
he comes to the Gideon and Gideon's insecurities are so high and Gideon's vision is so small. His whole idea about life is how to survive. His whole idea about life is how to go to work, make money, sleep, go to vacation and then repeat the whole thing again. And God comes to him and says, I want to save a whole nation through you. And Gideon says, God, you're speaking to the wrong tree. I am not that kind of person. I don't want to be a hero. I never struggled with I never struggled with this savior syndrome when I was in high school. Everybody always wanted to reach high goals. I never had any goals because I don't care about these things. I don't even want to be a successful farmer God. I just want to survive and God says well you want to survive but I want to use you and I have a very big vision. Why do you have this big vision? Because I have a big love for people. I know this that they disobeyed me but my love for these people is bigger than that and I could overlook that and I want to pick them up and get it I want to use you I want to tell you something today each person if you're a follower of Jesus Christ you have no luxury of living a life of survival you have no luxury of living a life from paycheck to paycheck you don't have a luxury to live a life for just to get a bachelor's degree get married have two children a dog a truck and a house you can only do that if there will be no God and if there will be no hell and if there will be no Savior and if there will be no Holy Ghost. But because there is Holy Spirit, because there is heaven, because there is hell and because there is pain and suffering in this world, you and I do not have a luxury to know a God who loves the world and have a this tiny vision for this world that He loves. And simply live a life caring about our pain and not caring about the pain of others. When we rub shoulders with Almighty God, the warmth of his love very soon will begin to touch our heart and we begin to see our life as very small compared to this big vision. God's big vision is because God's of big love. God has big love and we want to keep up with God. I want to see thousands and thousands of people give their lives to Jesus every single service. I'm not talking about once a year, I'm talking about every single service. The eight people who got baptized today, I want to one day we will see on Wednesday night 80 people getting baptized. Because why? Not because I am smart, brilliant and talented and because I have big ambitions. I grew up without any ambitions in life whatsoever. But when my pastor started to introduce me to a God whose ambitions is so high because his love is so high, it stretched my ambitions and my insecurities to at least a little bit more. Maybe God can use a man like me with a thick accent, a man who has maybe some physical other things that should have not been there. But if God can use a man like this, God can use a woman and a man like you to touch a generation and to touch people who today are suffering and he wants to pour his love through you and me. What must we do? Let me just give you three simple things. One, we must overcome our low insecurity. Our poor self-esteem must be overcome if we are to become agents of the vision of God in our generation. People who have low self-esteem are people who drive, it's like driving your car on an e-brake. It will squeak, you will drive too slow, you will eventually destroy your car and you will not get somewhere as you're supposed to get if you are driving an e-brake. Anytime we live with a very small narrow thinking just about me, me myself and I, what that does is it limits the flow of God's vision and limits the flow of God's grace in our lives. God is very big and he wants to show big through you and through me. Are we gonna let him? Can somebody say amen? amen? You know I heard a story of when one little uh, farmer who went hunting and he found eagle eggs and these were really big size eggs and he took them from the nest illegally brought them home to his barn where the chickens were and this big egg fit perfectly in the nest with the other chicken eggs and when this big egg an eaglet come, came out of this egg and the chickens came out of other eggs and the eaglet was a little bit bigger than the chickens but it fit right into the barn and the little eagle eaglet grew up with the chicken. It learned how to talk like a chicken, eat like a chicken, walk like a chicken, sleep like a chicken and think like a chicken. Until one day an eagle came to the barn and said you're not a chicken. And the little chickens looked at the little eaglet and says yes he is. We grew up together. We came out of the same hospital. We gave him a name. He's just like us. But an eagle looked at the eaglet and says you're not a chicken. Just because You've been with the chicken, 
you live like a chicken you eat like a chicken and think like a chicken that doesn't mean you're a chicken he says because chickens they are entrapped by the ground but something inside of you tells you that there is more than just walking on the ground that you're walking in that these wings are meant to carry you instead of you carrying them and he took this little eaglet on the side of the cliff and he pushed him off the cliff and that's when the little chicken behind the eaglet said oh my goodness our friend is dying our friend is dying he's not gonna make it and yes he was dying because he never opened his wings and so he started going down and he says that's it I am dying I knew I was not an eagle I was a chicken but then something clicked I'm gonna spread these instead of covering them and he started to spread his wings and right before he fit, hit the ground he mastered a very small art of what makes an eagle an eagle where he spread his wings and he never came back to the chicken house where he grew up in I want to tell you something today maybe you grew up all your life believing you're a chicken maybe you grew up all your life being defined by your past defined by your trauma and defined by what people said about you maybe like a chicken you were trapped to the ground trapped to certain events and to certain characteristics your appearance all your life but I want to tell you because of Jesus Christ God comes to you like he came to Gideon and he tells you today listen you may live like a chicken you may think like you may act like a chicken and you may see all the chicken around you but listen you are an eagle you are made in the image and likeness of God you may have never soared in life before maybe you've never seen yourself in any other light before but listen there is a God in heaven and he made you he created you and he has a plan for your life and it's bigger than what you're living in today when I my, when my family when our family immigrated to the United States I was 13 years of age and I remember for 13 years I was a good boy, a Christian boy. I went to church. We never did any big sins in Ukraine. We didn't have a TV. We didn't even have a telephone. The only thing that we were allowed to do is play soccer and you couldn't do much sin with playing soccer. We were Christian, good people, but I grew up always believing because of my physical appearance and because never been given an opportunity, I always grew up believing that I was nobody and that God cannot use a person like me. I was very shy of people and those of you who knew me from before the person that I am now I was extremely extremely shy I had the shyness times three on steroids very shy of people I was very insecure about myself I always believed that somebody who looked at me always had a bad opinion about me and the funny part is I was always right because when I would meet with them I was so awkward that I knew people felt that awkwardness and they would distance themselves from me and my pastor he would sit me down in the van and we would go about doing some things that they would do some either construction or some things in the church remodeling and I remember it like yesterday I was just like this poor little chicken sitting over there and my pastor keep telling me he says God is going to use you and I didn't want to say anything back because I knew that I'm going to provoke him and he's going to say more so I kept it quiet but I was like in the back of my mind I was like he doesn't know who he's talking to I don't have speaking abilities I'm scared of people I am shy I grew up believing that I was worthless and nobody and here is a man who says you're an eagle God can use you God needs people and he can use anybody he doesn't have much people so he'll use you and pastor kept telling me telling me telling me and honestly years later somehow that broke through into my spirit and living 13 years like a chicken I finally dared and tried maybe I am not a chicken and I'm gladly to announce today I'm not a chicken I'm an eagle and so are you your mistakes your past your all the things you went through they should remind you that there is a God but they should never define you that you don't have no future everything you went through should remind you that you've been hurt but it should never define you that you will be always like this failure is an event it's not a person failure is what happens it's not who you are and you have to be a person like Gideon he's over there insecure hiding from his enemies and God comes on the side as though ignores everything that Gideon is going through and says Gideon you're a mighty man of valor and Gideon looks at God and says God did you know that I'm threshing weed in a wine press wine press is where you're supposed to thresh grapes you know why I'm doing that God because I am scared I'm a coward I am the last coward you met in the whole land of Israel and God comes to him and says you're a mighty man of valor 
God will never endorse your insecurities. He will always endorse his word. He will always endorse revelation and your choice and my choice is this. Do I hold on to my fears, insecurities or do I hold on to God's revelation, spread my wings and see maybe perhaps what God says is true. Big visions will always get stopped in little people. Let's enlarge ourselves to the vision size God has by enlarging our view of ourselves to the size of God. Can somebody say amen? The second thing let's point out about Gideon is when Gideon overcame his low self-esteem God gave him an instruction and in this instruction God told him to go and destroy his idols. See the nation of Israel was full of idols. They started to worship them and this brought about slavery and bondage from the enemy and God says Gideon I love this country I want to use you to set free your country but Gideon we have to first get some idols out of your house the religion that has the most gods is the Hindu religion they have about 330 million gods that are mentioned and the average of a Hindu family has about eight gods that they worship and they worship from cows to other animals to, to plants and to other things and in this country we don't erect you know cows I hope you don't have any bulls in your house that you bow to or fat Buddhas or other things that we pray to and most people that is not really our issue but idol is not just something people worship out there in other countries idols is something we all have saying Augustine said idol is something that we worship instead of using or use instead of worshiping idol is actually three simple things it's what you love more than God. It's what you trust in more than God. It's in what you give more attention to more than God. That's really what idol is. It doesn't have to be a statue. It could be a vehicle. For some people it could be a hobby. For some people it could be a job. But this is what you must understand about idols. Idols, when you obsess with them, they will never return the favor and they will never give you blessing or joy. In return what idols will do is idols will oppress, depress and possess and crush a person that worships them. At the end of the day we all become what we worship. Idols are dead. Our God is living. Idols are false. Our God is true. Idols are always many. Our God is only one. Idols are always works of men's hands. Our God is the maker of men's hands. And idols is something when you worship it, you eventually become like it. And demons behind those idols begin to destroy our lives. Let me summarize everything what I mean by idols. In my own personal life, anytime I notice that my passion for God goes cold and I read the Bible and fall asleep, or if I pray and I have to kind of push myself to pray because there is no desire inside to pray. If it's, it's fine if it happens for first day. It's fine if it happens for day number two or day number three. As a Christian, not as a pastor, if it goes past day number three, I usually examine my heart because I know one thing about my heart. I'm not sure about yours, but I know about my heart. The reason I don't burn for God, it's not because God is not worth burning for. It's because I wasted my fuel somewhere else and sometimes somewhere else is not weed drinking or whiskey sometimes somewhere else could be entertainment sometimes somewhere else could be activity that I'm involved in where my passion is burning burning and then when I come to God there's that passion is plateauing or the passion is passive and that's when I know I have an idol and in that time I come to the Holy Spirit and I say Holy Spirit I know you cannot use me and I know that I am gonna die on inside being religious on the outside but on inside I'm gonna have no fire if I have an idol and sometimes I just simply have to plug my emotions out of a certain area of my life or trim certain thing and then you will see a passion come back for the Word of God the Word of God becomes sweeter prayer becomes exciting things of God become they give you life not because you're a religious person but because you're a person who has dealt with your idols if maybe you're looking today at what happening is what happening is tonight and you may say I'm not a religious person I am not one of those fanatics when it comes to God I am not very passionate 
but I am sure if we be both very honest there is area of your life you are fanatic about the most quiet person among us the most reserved person has an area of their life where they are head over heels and when they are in that area they're shouting they're screaming they're sweating and they're passionate so it, the question is not that you're not a passionate person the question is what are you passionate about that is your idol let's make God the source of our passion and he will in return love us back restore us bless us and revive us can somebody say amen can somebody say praise the Lord are you gonna make God your passion are you gonna make God your obsession come on put your hands together if you're that person when Gideon had this big vision from God and God enlarges enlarges his self-esteem and after that we see that God deals with his idols and he removes idols and his he begins to erect an altar for God and then the scripture says the Holy Spirit comes upon Gideon it will always happen like this when we deal with our idols the Holy Spirit will come and begin to touch our life in a very fresh and in a very new way and when that happens Gideon musters up a big army of some 30,000 soldiers to go against Midianites and uh, somebody said the Midianites had about 135,000 army so it was a very big army against a smaller army but Gideon feels good because he's never led an army in his life he's probably never went to war in his life and here people listen to him and some 30,000 people gather to gather to him because the Holy Spirit is moving in his life and when they all gathered Gideon gives him a proposal and says anybody who is scared and afraid you have the green pass to go home and some 20,000 people 22,000 people left home 22,000 people and Gideon is left with 10,000 men now I think Gideon's heart is shaking a little bit he's like maybe I want to go with them too and have these people go by themselves and fight and God comes to Gideon and says Gideon now you have brave men with you but Gideon they are too many I want you to bring them to a river and watch them very closely the way some people will drink those that will drink in a certain way I want you to keep them and so he would pay attention how different people drink and he found out that 10,000 people had a weird way of drinking water and it was exactly that way of drinking water that God says that they should go home and Gideon is left with 300 men and that's when his heart became scared and God comes to Gideon when Gideon doesn't have an army and says to Gideon the verse we read tonight Gideon I have given to you Midianites into your hands God I've lost 32,000 soldiers I have 300 guys we don't have weapons and you're giving me a promise that you already have defeated my enemies but God goes further he says Gideon I know you're scared go to your camp to the camp of the enemy and I want you to sneak in and eavesdrop on some conversations and it so happens as he goes into the camp of the enemy that two guys are sharing a dream and one man is sharing a dream to another man and this is the dream he says he says at night when I was sleeping there was this dream and in the dream there was this big tent it was symbolic of us and a loaf of barley a loaf of bread rolled from the mountain hit the tent and the tent crashed he says I think I know what that loaf of bread is and the other man says I think so too he said that loaf of bread is Gideon have you ever seen in your right mind what a piece of bread can cause a tent to collapse that doesn't even happen in movies that doesn't happen in life here is two guys who have a nightmare that their big tent will be destroyed by a piece of bread 
and a Gideon is listening in and I think at that time that's when Holy Spirit gives him a vision and tells him if your enemy is having nightmares about you you're gonna do just fine and his faith got encouraged he came to his men and he says guys we're gonna do something tonight we don't have swords bazookas tanks missiles we don't have knives what we do have is we have torches and we have trumpets and at night we will surround them and we will just just scare them and that's it we will light up the fire it will look like there is many of us and we will all start sounding the trumpet it will sound like there is many of us and since we have an all night to keep them scared we're gonna hope and pray to God that they won't know that there was only 300 unarmed men came against them I want to tell you something tonight sometimes you come to a place like Gideon where your army gets smaller where your resources get smaller where your health gets smaller your finances get smaller where things in life get smaller and people many times get extremely afraid and they do not know what to do next especially when walking with God it seems that it didn't make things better it actually made things worse what do you do then most people this is what they do this is what 22,000 people would do go back home drop the idea about healing because the sickness is getting worse drop the idea that my child can serve God because he just got sent from one prison to another drop the idea that my situation can change because my car just got repossessed drop the idea that I can overcome this particular issue in my life because I just got hit last night again and I crushed under the same issue and what usually we tend to do when things get worse and things don't get better is we love the safe place called retreat but the man of faith does not retreat man of faith takes one more step and says I will take one more step and I will see the glory of God I will take one more step and I will advance and I will see a miracle of God he said what if you will die but what if I will see the glory of God the man of faith does not know that while you are there thinking you might die actually God is planning a very big surprise for the enemy and a very big miracle for you when your army is getting smaller make sure your vision doesn't get smaller make sure your faith doesn't get smaller make sure your vision gets more clear make sure your relationship with Holy Spirit gets closer and your dependence on the promises of God gets more dependent and only then you will overcome every issue and every problem in your life for the glory of God can somebody say amen sometimes we think that the promises of God relationship with the Holy Spirit what does that do to you if you don't have connections if you don't have the funds if you don't have the medicine if you don't have the insurance if you don't have this and that if you don't have a good doctor what is all of this will do to you but let me remind you Midianites had a good army Midianites had good weapons Midianites had numbers what they didn't have is they didn't have a vision from God they didn't have a promise from God and they didn't have the Holy Spirit and at night it took a small fire a small trumpet and it spooked them so much that instead of realizing there is an army of 300 unarmed men they lunged against one another and start killing one another and they died without the Holy Spirit with your best things at your disposal you will make a mountain out of a molehill you will exaggerate your problem exaggerate your fears and they will destroy your life with the Holy Spirit you can overcome the biggest fear that we must have is not the fear of problems it's the fear of going through life without God the biggest fear is not cancer it's not leukemia diabetes eating disorders and it's not even when a problem happens in a family and we have no solution for the biggest problem is to walk through life alone without the Holy Spirit because then 300 men can walk on the horizon who are not armed and I'm panicking and stabbing myself just like Midianites sometimes you will meet people without God and they have everything they have two cars two houses a wonderful income and they have health 
but they don't have life inside and you may say a person like you if I could only give this life to someone they will be the happiest person in the world but you're one of the most miserable people I meet in this world why because without the Holy Spirit we make mountains out of molehills but with the Holy Spirit we turn those mountains into molehills and overcome them for the glory of God can somebody say amen when you come to a place called impossible there is always one more step where God can do the incredible the impossible become possible for the glory of God can somebody say amen you know many years ago when our pastor was looking to purchase a building and he purchased this building this building at the time was for sale and our church we didn't have an account our church did not have money in our savings and at the time our church had only three families and our pastor wanted to purchase a building our church only started some six or seven months that it existed we had a big vision our pastor had a big vision that we will have so many people come to Jesus well we didn't speak English but big vision and the pastor embarked on a journey to purchase a building just to make it clear to you just a few years ago we were trying to refinance this building that we've been in it paying faithfully and we have rental coming in from school and other churches and we were still not able to refinance it some 10 years ago supernaturally we received this building and till this day there is a school that's renting this facility and every single month faithfully paying for all the mortgage and all the utility bills do you know why God gave us this building? To give us something in our past as a point of reference. That when you're down to nothing, you don't know no one, you don't have any connections, but you have me. Sometimes if God is all you got, God is all you need. And when you come to a place of impossible, not hard, we're not talking about hard, we're talking about impossible. And it seems there is no more way usually a nature, nature, natural thing to do is simply to retreat but a man of faith says no I'm gonna take one more step into the unknown and I don't know that the next step I step into could be actually my miracle and the breakthrough that God has for my life and some 10 years later we speak English today 10 years later all of you are here sitting in this beautiful sanctuary and we're all praising God and people will get saved tonight and some people will get healed tonight and all of that because my pastor in the face of impossible situation didn't run from it ran through it he didn't know what would be the outcome but he knew who holds the future and the future is in the hands of God there was one young man who was coming to our church a few years ago and he was diagnosed with four mental disorders these four mental disorders rendered him completely useless I remember when he was sitting right here when he came to one of our prayer lines it was pitiful to look at him because he was sitting in the service and he would be scorched like this and he would hit himself he had a tick disorder he had to be kicked out of school put also on a suicide watch because he tried to commit suicide and his family came to the end of possible because there was no more cure for him when they came here for prayer and we started to pray for him during our prayer line during the first prayer he started to puke things out and he felt a little bit better but the family didn't give up they came again to the next prayer line some few months later and he started puking more stuff out he already felt a little bit better but he started puking more stuff out some five or some months ago he comes again except this time not scorched twisted he comes grown he gains some weight and brings a high school graduation certificate when he went back to school finished the school and says now in Seattle area he is helping a youth pastor whereas before he was on a suicide watch now God is using him to touch other people impossible became incredible because someone refused to retreat when things get hard sometimes things will get harder before they get better but don't be like the 22,000 who say I'm gonna go home because this looks suicide. This looks too hard. This is too difficult. Be a person like Gideon who says, you know what? My God has brought me to this and my God is gonna bring me through it. And on the other side of the impossible, I will see the incredible and I will see the glory of God. You say, what if you will see nothing? 
you will never know until you take a step to see the glory of God a young lady who was getting baptized today just a few weeks ago she gave her life to Jesus and she mentioned how God set her free and that night she threw away her drugs but there was one more problem that she had that she did not notice and didn't mention in the video is that about four years ago when she was in a car and she was eight months pregnant she went through a car accident and because of that car accident she received a very big trauma in her emotions and in her mind that trauma was so severe that even when she would talk about the car accident right here after her salvation she would start shaking and she said ever since then I cannot be in a car without paranoia and I cannot drive a car impossible but not without God and I remember when we prayed with her against that fear and I gave her the assignment I said you are going to overcome this fear one way or the other for Israel God split the Red Sea for Noah he helped him build a ship for some people he will bring down the walls for others he will help you to climb over them but you are going to overcome this issue and I asked her I'm like could you do me a favor could you take a pen and a notebook and begin to write in your notebook for God has not given me spirit of fear but spirit of power love and sound mind and I want you to write one after another one after another until you write 1,000 times and after you write 1,000 times we will pray for you again and you will get behind the wheel I was upstairs today preparing she drove into the service by herself I came to her and I said you're driving I came and I said what's going on I thought we agreed you finish a thousand verses and then we pray and then you drive she says it's been two weeks now ever since I started writing those verses and I start believing that impossible can be turned to incredible he said God started to take the fears away and she says now I can drive without any anxiety she said I still have about a hundred more times to write I said you better finish that so that you can drive for the glory of God for the rest of your life can somebody say amen nothing is impossible to our God can somebody say amen nothing is impossible to our God he can take the impossible situation and turn it into incredible no matter where you are today no matter how difficult it's been and no matter how hard it's gotten or how you got pushed to the ground I want to tell you something what Jesus told a man who lost his daughter when he started to walk with Jesus a man had a daughter who was sick came to Jesus said Jesus please help my daughter Jesus says for sure let's go see your daughter as they're walking the daughter is getting worse and worse and worse the pulse stops the heartbeat stops and they rush to that man and say don't trouble the teacher your daughter is dead that means your situation have gotten worse since you start believing in God and at that moment the man had a choice do I retreat or do I advance and I'm so glad Jesus was there because Jesus grabbed that man's hand and he says do not be afraid he said only believe he took that man by hand and he says both of us are walking into your daughter's room and as they walked into the daughter's room the daughter was lifeless she was dead but Jesus prayed for her and she came back to life and a miracle happened in that house a miracle can happen in your house in my house in our house if we don't retreat when things get hard but we take one more step and advance to see the glory of God. If somebody's